Welcome everybody to this final session of the future evaluation event and uh, welcome back to all the participants uh, who were involved in the earlier sessions um, we've all learned a lot and I hope we uh, and I expect we'll learn a lot in this session. I'm Dion Filmer and the director of the research group here at the World Bank and I'll be moderating to uh, this session on the impact of new data and technology on evaluation. If you're anything like me, you live in a world where you're bombarded with information about AI, uh, sources of data that are increasing, new tools to analyze data. This data revolution is really, I mean, it's been going on for a while, but it's, it's it, with AI, it's really getting started on a whole new wave. Um, today's discussion will focus on how these advances in technology are influencing the approach to evaluation and learning from evidence uh, and how we uh, might uh, expect this to change in the future. Uh, we'll be looking at the data revolution from a variety of perspectives with our panel of data science, development, economics, and evaluation experts. First, to set the stage for the discussion, we have Veronica Olazabal, who will provide us with an overview of the current and evolving role of data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence in evaluation. Veronica is a former president of the American Evaluation Society, She's currently a lecturer at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University and is the Chief Impact and Evaluation Officer at the BHP Foundation. So to kick us off, over to you, Veronica. Thank you, Dan, and welcome back to everyone who's been with, uh, here with the IAG all week. Thank you for the I, to the IAG for inviting me to provide these opening remarks and congratulations on 50 years. So I'm going to start uh, with sharing my screen, and hopefully that will, here we go. Can everyone see that? Dion, yes? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Uh, so we've been talking a lot this week about transformation, systems change, and the importance of context. Um, but really importantly, we've been talking about evaluation use uptake for decision making. And there's this, been this sentiment that it's not where it needs to be in order to make development more effective. And so today we're gonna talk about uh, something a little bit different uh, and an opportunity to address some of the challenges uh, for uptake. And while the challenges as discussed just in the previous panel uh, has a lot to do with the social political dynamics of a particular context, um, today, we're going to talk about three that as an investor and a funder um, and someone that is an evaluation practitioner in the space for a number of years, the uh, three that come up often, and that are, that is uh, dimensions around timeliness, cost, and the ability to say something generalizable at large scales. Uh, and we're going to do that through speaking about the impact of new data and technology on evaluation. So first I'd like to level set uh, and talk a little bit about what it is we're really talking about. Oftentimes as evaluators, we work with pretty limited data sets, which gives us this perspective that uh, when we're talking about things like big data and data science and now artificial intelligence, as Dion mentioned, we're still applying some of those concepts. So I wanna level set and talk about some of the data that we're actually talking about. And so um, this is from one of the latest reports uh, from, on the state of uh, digital uh, from 2023. It came out in January 2024. Um, and basically, um, it points to the fact that there are 5 billion people with actual identities on, in, on the Internet, online. And so that's not the 8 billion. And there are gaps. And the report speaks about some of those gaps and how those gaps are challenging. Uh, however, the report also says it quantifies how much time we spend on in every individual user, yourselves, myself, how much time we spend online on average on social media platforms like Instagram, like TikTok, like Facebook still, um, WhatsApp. And that is two hours and 23 minutes per day. And so when we look at all of the world's internet users and we uh, quantify how much, extrapolate how much that would be for an entire year, we're talking about 260 trillion minutes on social media platforms. And this equals 500 million, million years of collective human time just in 2023. 
So all of these interactions are generating data points, a lot of data points, the kind of data points that we as individuals can't collect ourselves, the kind that won't be housed in our own individual computers. So with this growth, this exponential growth in data points comes the need for new data methods. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but I know that our panelists today are going to speak much more in depth. And so here, uh, I'm not sure how many of you are paying attention, but in 2022, something called ChatGBT was launched. And that ultimately revolutionized um, and helped to bring to the mainstream something called nat natural language processing and generative AI. These are tools that can be used uh, to interpret the millions and millions and trillions of data points that are in the um, internet ethernet, <laughs> I'm going to say the ether. Um, and as they came into the mainstream, it very much increased our abilities to use computers to process human language. And so here you see a schematic of a document all the way to the upper left, um, of some coding that happens here in the middle in terms of an algorithm. And, uh, and the generation of various different reports that say something about questions that we have asked uh, and that we are continuously asking. Um, and this is courtesy of Peter York from BCT Partners, a uh, luminary in this particular space, one of the few evaluators that can actually um, exist and interpret this work. But this process essentially speeds up the efficiency um, and improves the accuracy, validity, and reliability of, of our evaluations in two specific ways. The first is it gives us the ability to um, analyze a lot of documents. As evaluators, we're often analyzing a lot of documents, qualitative information um, in a very systematic way. You can code the algorithm to tell you to say something systematic about the thousands of, or the hundreds of documents that we're looking at. But number two, it also allows us the ability to systematically analyze um, data uh, and qualitative data specifically uh, through narratives that we've collected. And so it, we've been, many of us have grown up in the space of mixed methods. It gives us the capabilities to do this at a very different level. And so uh, I'm gonna, uh, pause there, but if there are any questions, I can share examples. Um, if we have time, I'm happy to. In addition, um, with these new data methods, um, we've seen an increase in new technologies. And these technologies, um, uh, like satellite imagery, remote sensing, and GIS, and something we've been talking about, if you're a geographer, you've been talking about this for some time, but it's come into the mainstream as well. And it's expanded our capacity to consider questions around scale and sustainability. And that comes back to the point that I raised earlier in terms of generalizability. We can now say not just things about point X, the place in point X, but the region that point X sits within. We can say something about a large scale. We can ask different questions about sustainability. Uh, that we've not been able to because, quite frankly, the technology prevented us from doing so. So what does this actually mean for uh, evaluation? And so we're, we're, I'm kind of positioning this from a from and a to. So here we are in our from space. We've been talking, uh, and we've been talking a lot about how this evaluation from a development effectiveness perspective is top down. And it is. It's top down, I'm a funder. I get to set uh, the parameters around what and who will be evaluating something. Um, and it creates these very highly deliberate, um, often stage gated strategies with predefined outcomes. Think theory of change that we've been advocating um, for, for so many years, it comes with predefined outcomes. Um, it locks us into particular narratives that may or may not be true and prevents us from probably seeing lots of other things. Two, more bottoms up emergent strategies with outcomes evolving as the work matures because we can ask questions at different intervals in time. We no longer need to ask questions at a discrete after 
project moment. Um, and that actually changes the nature of what we call m and &E, which emerged as an accountability and a compliance um, tool in government to a tool that can be used to adaptively manage and learn. And this helps us to manage risks of harm and unintended consequences. And as you know, while we as evaluators talk about impacts being both positive and negative, intended, unintended, direct and indirect, we really spend most of our time talking about the positive effects because we can't see the negative. This actually allows us to start to ask those types of questions much earlier on in the project life cycle. As has been uh, mentioned earlier this week as a necessity for starting to think about evidence-based decision-making. Um, we're moving away from largely retrospective with limited qualitative information, as mentioned, to something that can be routine, consistent, timely, prompt, at a larger scale, both quantitatively and qualitatively. We're moving away from being absolutely comprehensive about every single indicator, every single output, every single out, uh, outcome in an m and &E framework to something that allows us to be deeper focused, um, asking deep questions about most critical and certain issues and assumptions and hypotheses. And that is a particular skill that one needs when you're actually trying to be evaluative at earlier points in a project life cycle, when you're thinking prospectively and generating value to decision making. We're moving away from traditional methods of data collection analysis, which can be expensive and slow, to more, as we've just talked about, cutting edge approaches for data collection, which can generate insights quickly and cost effectively, which are the points that I raised earlier in terms of some of the barriers that prevent evidence-based decision making. And we're moving away from being dependent on self-reported household level data to thinking about direct user feedback, social media, and human generated. It's changing the nature of our capabilities. And so from this work, there are a couple of learnings to keep in mind. And so one of which really importantly is, uh, is about data safeguarding and responsibility. Those issues are no longer issues that certain evaluators who work with data need to be considering. All evaluators, uh, in fact, all policymakers need to be thinking about how to protect people and people's data more responsibly and integrating it throughout the evaluation life cycle. It, this is no longer negotiable. We cannot put people in harm's way because we want cheaper, faster data insights to make the world a better place. Um, we've also learned that humans must remain in the loop. Um, leading, reviewing, we all will still have jobs um, because it's our job to code and decrease bias in the data. And um, even though we are having the session and it's an exciting place it's all about possibilities, it also creates a lot of fear. So I should let you know that AI capacity is low in most organizations still. It's still early days and it does require an upfront investment of the level of capacity for evaluators to learn new skills, for the technology, for the systems to be a bit more upscaled um, and even for training of the algorithm. But it is an exciting opportunity, and I look forward to hearing how our panelists integrate um, these points throughout their um, talking points. Thank you very much. Thanks, Veronica. That was fa fascinating. I, I, I appreciated both the sort of the those incredible statistics you started off with, which were pretty amazing, and then also, but also the the sort of sober ending with the, the, some a, a reality check on on what's happening. Um, and I really appreciate how you spelled out this um, transition to kind of real-time evaluation. I mean, all those elements in that matrix really were pointing to real-time and feedback loops as opposed to kind of an ex post look back. So really, thank you very much. They're fascinating. Um, we're going to turn it now to our panel. Uh, we have three really interesting, exciting uh, panelists. We have Emmanuel Letouzet, who's the director of the Data Pop Alliance and founder and executive director of Open Algorithms. We have Estelle Raimondo, who's the head of methods at the Independent Evaluation Group. And we have Nagaraja Rao Harshadeep, who goes by Harsh, uh, who's the Disruptive Technology Global Lead in the Sustainable Development Practice Group here at the World Bank. So each panelist is going to uh, have about five minutes. Uh, we're going to start with Emmanuel. Um, Emmanuel, what, according to you, are the implications of the data and technology revolution for research academic policy evaluation more, gen more generally. 
Manuel? Yes, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. All right, so um, yes, yeah, so thank you very much um, for the, well, the invitation. Um, I think it's indeed very timely and thank you Veronica for the, for the indeed very interesting uh, comprehensive introduction. Um, so yeah, so I think overall, I think the, um, and, and, and some of it has been uh, indeed summarized by, by, uh, by Veronica, but, uh, you know, we live in a both, you know, exciting and, and, you know, pretty frightening times. Um, so if we look back, of course, um, we are sort of like, I think, entering the, the second decade uh, of the so-called data and indeed, you know, AI revolution. Um, and it's had an effect, an impact on, on many aspects of the work we do, but also, on, of course, on the world in general, both, both positive and, and, and negative. In, in the field of, um, of, of evaluation more specifically, uh, so there have been also already you know, quite a few uh, you know, discussions and attempts at trying to grasp the, the, the applications and implications of the data revolution, the AI revolution. Um, and so, you know, for example, uh, I think it was already almost eight years ago that actually, you know, Estelle was one of the uh, co-editors of a book uh, on the implications of new technology for uh, the evaluation of, uh, you know, complex interventions in which I wrote a chapter, uh, co-authored a chapter on, on, on big data, and now we would call this, uh, you know, AI. Um, and then actually, uh, I think five years ago, we also wrote a um, a, a, a report on uh, the the impact of uh, of new technology and data for um, so for evaluation uh, with with Southern Voice, um, and so it seemed like a, you know a very long time ago, but actually you know it was you know quite recent, uh, and so I think the, the the so the field has has moved and you know taken up you know some of those uh, new, new new technology on board. Uh, I think the main the, the main point I want to you know, stress is that the field has moved from M&E to meal, and that's you know something that is you know well known, but that that should be I think strengthened. So meal, of course, is you know is monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning. Um, and I think increasingly the last two, so accountability and learning, should be uh, front and center. In uh, in everything that that we do, uh, and it you know it was mentioned by Veronica. You know, accountability is about the ability uh, to know what people you know care about, uh, to to be more transparent about the uh, the conclusions of an evaluation, um, but also the um, uh, but also what needs to be, to be evaluated. Uh, what are the what are the criteria against which which uh, you know the, the the effectiveness of an intervention or program or policy is evaluated. So when we try to understand what works, uh, you know what what are actually the the, the objectives, um, and then uh, there is the the point of learning, uh, which for me is absolutely critical. Um, we and and here there's a nice analogy uh, with or between, of course, you know, AI and, and machine learning and human, human learning. Um, and I think, uh, the, you know, the, the, the future and of evaluation, but I would say the future of, of human societies, um, should be about strengthening our collective willingness and ability to learn from, from feedback. Um, and that's, and that's difficult. Uh, and, as Veronica mentioned or, or stressed, humans um, should absolutely be in the loop, but we haven't really figured out how to do that, uh, neither for program policy evaluation um, and, and nor at the level of, of society. So um, I think it's kind of like the frontier is how to, um, with respect to both accountability and learning, how to actually very concretely, very practically uh, place and keep and put human societies and, and communities, especially vulnerable groups, in the loop at scale. So I will just, you know, end there for the time being, um, and then happy to dig more into the implications for, you know, data systems, data collection, uh, reliability, privacy, and, and, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thanks, Emmanuel. I, I sense a recurring theme here of, of, of 
technology leaping ahead, but the importance of keeping humans involved and, and humans in the driver's seat. Um, Estelle, over to you as a, somebody who has uh, the word methods in their title, I think I'm going to pitch a sort of a methods question to you, which is what are the implications of the data and technology revolution for evaluation? And more specifically, how will AI, and, and you, know, you could be a little bit broader than I if you want, how will that transform the practice of evaluation? Thank you very much, Dion. Um, yeah, let me build on my my two colleagues who've already kind of set up a, a really nice foundations for us. Um, so I'm an evaluator, so I'm very comfortable looking back, not very much in foresight. Um, so um, today I'm a little bit challenged, but I will pretty much, you know, tell you what have been the implications so far for our work at IEG? We have, you know, I think taken up the challenge that Emmanuel and others like Michael Bamberger have, have put for us eight, eight years ago to, to really try to harness this data revolution. And we've moved from aspiration to really a moment of experimentation. And I think we're very much in that phase and we will probably be there for a while. Um, and so for us, we've had a little bit of you know, what Veronica has highlighted, this, this kind of three types of learning have, have been happening. Um, some of you are familiar with this, you know, single loop, double loop, and triple loop learning from, from uh, Chris and Shun, and I think it's a really good, good framework for us. So we've done some single loop learning, which is, you know, trying to harness um, machine learning, natural language processing first, and now more generative AI uh, through uh, GPT and its, um, and its API um, to be more efficient and to, be, to, to have more reliability in the tasks that we perform on a routine basis. So as Veronica said, we tended to do a lot of manual coding. We have the chance to be in an institution that generates a ton of text on every single one of its projects, which means that, you know, when uh, we evaluate, we have portfolios of 300, 400 projects uh, multiplied by the number of documents. So all of that we used to do manually um, with large team of analysts. Uh, now we are really trying to harness um, these techniques um, to be more efficient, more reliable, and hopefully more accurate. So we've done that quite a lot, and, and I think we're we are on a good path for that. That's our first um, learning loop. We've also done some double loop learning, which is to try to basically um, use new data to answer old questions, um, meaning, you know, the traditional evaluation questions of, of relevance, of effectiveness. Um, and here we've harvested and harnessed quite a lot the, the, the images data. So, for instance, you know, to answer questions of relevance of targeting um, of our of World Bank Group uh, interventions in country and in country program evaluation, we're now able to really use geospatial um, data, remote sensing, uh, data to do that better than we used to do before, which was mostly through through interviews and, and a little bit of, of, of mapping. Um, we've also um, answered impact questions and effectiveness questions uh, with, with even you know, image as data, such as uh, 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 using deep learning to extract features from Google images um, to have really uh, uh, much more uh, uh, opportunities to, to look in depth at particular uh, places, we've been able to, um, you know, reconstruct comparison group, have panel data that we didn't have access to before. Um, and so harnessing new data to answer all questions has been has been also something we've, we've tried. And finally, the triple loop learning um, is where we are trying a little bit more, which is asking new questions, looking at different approaches, uh, cha uh, challenging our paradigms, challenging our approach to truth, which always was very deductive. And, you know, we had our theory of change. We tried to test that. Um, and so this is a little bit more incipient. But for instance, in some of our country program evaluations, we've also tried to get much deeper in social contracts issues, looking at social media, looking at media data, uh, and trying to question our own assumption. And I think that's where we are currently, and trying to even, um, you know, perhaps not fully abandon our standards of norms and practices and quality standards. This is this is still what we stand by for as evaluators, but try to be challenged in our own thinking and really embrace complexity. 
I'll leave you with just a few thoughts on the conditions under which I think we can continue to learn and experiment. And to me, at this stage in our journey, it kind of boils down to five things. The first is really the spirit of experimentation. And it's not always the case in evaluation offices and evaluation functions. And at IG, we have, we have this privilege, I think, of being able to take some risks. But that also means bringing, um, bringing others along and, and be able to fail and be able to, to grow. That's a big one. A second is having data scientists embedded in our teams. This is really essential. Um, but at the same time, it's not sufficient. We need knowledge brokers. We need people who can uh, have sufficient data science or AI literacy and evaluation literacy to really kind of bridge that space um, as well as with stakeholders, et cetera. The third thing we need is um, to really have um, 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 a strategy behind our experimentation and learning and try to go from, you know, one-off attempts to really think about under what conditions some of these applications work and have some scale um, and have some more mainstreaming of approaches. That's what we've been able to do in some. And for others, be willing to just give up after a couple of, of tries in different contexts, because perhaps at this stage, we still don't have uh, um, what, what we need. And finally, I think we really need to be in, embedded in networks uh, that are much larger than evaluation networks, um, that bring people who uh, really come from different worlds, data, I mean, Emmanuel's world is, is a bridging world as well, uh, but much beyond that, so that we can be fully aware of the risks um, or as fully as you know the, the time gives, um, but also willing to continue to try and try with others um, and, and and try to really uh, get someone in our blind spots so that we can we can keep uh, thinking this through both on the perils and on the promises. I'll leave you with that for now. Thanks, Estelle. That was fascinating, and I again I appreciate the the, the perils and promise kind of notion. <laughs> um, uh, Harsh, over to you. Um, so for you, I mean, you work in the, in the social development um, part of the World Bank. So how is big data helping the World Bank understand the outcomes of its activities in the water sector in particular? And, and if you want to go more generally into the environment sector. Yeah, sure. I uh, actually work in the sustainable development uh, part of the bank, uh, uh, which is... Uh, the new planet vertical uh, that we are working on. Uh, and if we look at evaluation, basically the, uh, the demand is changing and the supply is changing. So if we think about the demand, because the bank has embraced uh, a new mission on a livable planet, uh, it becomes important to then start looking at issues of uh, pollution, natural resources management, uh, water resources management, climate adaptation mitigation, and so on, uh, biodiversity and other aspects, which gives a whole new uh, world of, uh, of evaluation that's uh, required, both at uh, the big picture level, which is where a lot of these are now getting uh, reflected in the bank uh, corporate scorecards uh, for overall uh, planet evaluation and results evaluation and so on for the bank, as well as uh, to at the project level to try and then see how a lot of these could be uh, better reflected in uh, the work that we are doing. Uh, but this requires a whole new world of uh, scalable evaluation like we've been uh, hearing and it's in some ways like the theory of relativity uh, that Einstein said, where that what seems to be happening depends on who's observing it. And so uh, it's a time to try and see if we can observe from many different viewpoints uh, in uh, this uh, area for real time adaptive management as we move towards that. So that's why things are changing on the supply side as well. We are in a whole new world of uh, disruptive technology. And uh, one of the joys of being a global lead in disruptive tech at the bank is that you begin to see all the disruptions that are happening on the data value chain, new ways to collect data from Earth observation, from satellites, drones, and so on, all the way to uh, new sensors on the ground or new crowdsourcing of information or uh, uh, new uh, kind of uh, ways of taking old data and data rescue and so on, and having new ways to analyze these with geospatial and AI type approaches to move slowly up the data value chain to information, knowledge, and supporting planning and operating and evaluation uh, decisions in that uh, regard. And there's also a whole new world in terms of uh, the way you people make things, uh, as well as uh, uh, the way in which stakeholders interact with each other. 
So on the data side, I think uh, a lot of these new uh, types of systems are being uh, integrated also with new e-packaging options that we now have to try and make these things more interactive so that a uh, whole range of stakeholders can interface with these, as people were saying in the chat, to also leverage AI for uh, uh, translation and other aspects as well. So these become a bit more accessible and uh, also uh, ways in which uh, you can uh, help move towards this uh, continuous evaluation uh, and uh, adaptive management. So at the bank, uh, we are uh, starting, uh, we've been doing a lot of this work uh, over time, and we are particularly uh, excited by the fact that there's a new focus at the bank on digital aspects and trying to look at uh, uh, livable plan planet aspects. So we've been uh, leveraging a lot of tools to try and both provide uh, project support uh, for uh, individual projects as well as to look at, uh, and, and these could be at uh, national or subnational levels or even regional level like on the um, Nile or the Amazon and so on, or uh, also at the global uh, level. And that's where I think the future really is to see, can we use global services on data analytics, knowledge learning, partnerships, financing, and so on, to be able to support work at the regional and uh, subnational and national and subnational levels. And this is where there's a whole new world of uh, open data and cloud analytics that's coming in, along with a new world of uh, uh, interactive dashboards uh, that we are leveraging. And we're also trying to see how to improve our own capacity in this regard. I'm trying to do a lot of harsh deep learning myself, but uh, we're also trying to do uh, work to try and see, can we also create help desks in this regard to try and help our staff and our clients leverage this whole new exciting world of technology. So we've created a team we call our kids, for example, Knowledge, Information and Data Services Help Desk. And so uh, they've become the interface to try and help teams to leverage all of these data to say, what kind of earth observation data do we have on this aspect for this country? Or can we look at this project? And we're working at some uh, IEG evaluations as well to see if we can help uh, provide uh, information on LEVI and changes like that for a lot of these natural resources projects. Uh, so I think looking ahead, there's a lot of, uh, there's going to be a lot of use of uh, geospatial data, using a geospatial AI, uh, a generative AI, uh, uh, these interactive dashboards. Uh, we're trying to do these uh, uh, very interesting spatial chatbots, for example, as well. And also ways of uh, doing interactive e-packaging in the form of story maps, e-books, and other aspects. But in the end, it comes down to us all becoming more, uh, to have a lot of these new technologies better socialized within the system, both within the bank system and as well as uh, with our clients. And that's where I think a lot of the new focus uh, needs to be to help us retool with new people and also with new skills that we all need to continuously keep uh, learning in this uh, regard. But all this should help us uh, enter and embrace a whole new world of uh, technology when it comes to uh, evaluation. So uh, happy to discuss uh, more on this. Back to you, Dion. Thanks, Harsh, and uh, apologies for mischaracterizing your I work in the social space, so I had social on the We line. all work in the social space, so <laughs> no worries. Apologies. So um, I'm going to suggest we do the following. We've received a lot of um, interesting questions on the chat and then the Q&A. Um, I'm going to suggest we sort of go do a one round for in the for all the people who all the presenters um, in the order that that uh, that they went before. So we'll start with Veronica and then Emmanuel, Estelle, then and, and Harsh. And I'm just going to try to give you some buckets of where the questions are, and maybe you could react a little bit on, on some of those. One of the biggest um, issues that has come up is um, to the bias inherent in some of these AI tools that's on a lot of people's minds. And and how and how can we ensure that there's um, this evaluated responsibility in offsetting that bias or, or, or working towards tools that, that minimize the, those biases? That's sort of one recurring question. Another recurring question is the digital divide. Uh, both north south and then within countries, um, you know, are these tools going to exacerbate some of those aspects? Um, an issue, I mean, I was watching the previous session that came up there, uh, and, and and this is something Emmanuel uh, and some of the others uh, alluded to, which is experimentation and the willingness to fail. I think in evaluation, that's a constant issue. 
Um, and I know one of the panelists in the previous panel sort of said, well, we should just stop working in countries that aren't willing to learn. <laughs> so it's sort of, it's a, you know, that's putting it quite star star starkly, but, but then this notion of experimentation, and then I'm going to throw in as a moderator, I'm going to use the moderator's privilege. I was really intrigued by what the uh, thing Estelle said about, you know, I work a lot in the impact evaluation space and, and, and one of the tensions between sort of impact evaluation and evaluation writ larger is sort of the notions of counterfactuals. And, and what you were referring to there in terms of using these tools to generate synthetic counterfactuals in ways that we haven't been able to in the past really brings these two like completely together. And I, I, I personally see that as an exciting development. Um, anyway, I'm not gonna ask each of you to respond to all of these, but if, if one of these or one or two of these resonate with you, please, if you wouldn't mind, um, picking up on those, or if you have any reactions to some of the other panelists, that, that that would be fine too. So, you know, if we could keep your interventions to a, a couple of minutes each, and then we might even have time for one more uh, rapid round, but let's start with you, Veronica. Sure, um, I'll, oh yes, you can hear me. I'll start with um, the question around minimizing bias. Um, and this is going to be a very simplistic response to this, but um, the way you minimize bias in, in an AI scenario is you can code it out. You can, if you know the bias exists, you can actually code the algorithm to address it systematically across all of your documents. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that we right size that because it's not as if these uh, AI um, algorithms are on their own. Humans are still needed to code them. Humans are biased, um, but if you're aware of the bias, you can address that. Um, and I wanted to address the gaps question because I think it's a very important point. Um, the gaps that we're seeing are not any different than the gaps that we've been talking about in terms of the digital divide and are just becoming exacerbated as we just talked about, and as you just mentioned. I come in, the, I, I sit within the philanthropic sector, so my finance um, and the capital is risk capital. And if we're aware of that, we can start to begin to fund for that. But I do think that um, more of the multilaterals, bilaterals, traditional funders really need to start thinking about their finance and both the doing of the work and the ability to expand into uh, supporting the building of the capabilities. And I know that the IEG has really been focused on evaluation capacity building. Um, and I think this is just one additional way that you can focus your evaluation capacity building. Um, and then last point, uh, the counterfactual. The beauty of these technologies, and while they don't come without risk, certainly, is exactly as Estelle said. There are um, methodologies now that can um, think about GIS and think about GIS as an impact evaluation tool where you can really retrospectively create either a counterfactual or a baseline. And so it does expand our capabilities if we're willing to move into that expansion and learn how to work collaboratively with others, such as data scientists, um, as well as building our own capabilities. Um, thank you. Thanks, Veronica. Emmanuel, any reactions? Um, yes, yeah, so maybe on the, the first um, you know, bucket to, to complement uh, of questions, so around like, you know, biases and 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 uh you know the the risk and the fear of a uh, widening digital device in, in in general which are indeed very real um so yeah just to complement what veronica was saying um i think one way also um how you can you know m minimize i would say you know both biases and um and and the and, and the risk of digital devices is, is to and it, it might also sound a bit simplistic, but it's still I think yeah you know, I think it's still the, the, the truth um, is through uh, yeah like very in, in, intentional inclusion uh, of um, you know of the of the you know very populations and communities and, and societies uh, in in, um, in you know in which a, a project or policy. Uh, or investment decision uh, is is implemented and and and, and deployed. Uh, and as I said earlier, um, yeah, it's it's difficult. And so that's why I stress the word intentional. Um, it doesn't happen uh, by by default or design. Uh, it really needs to be to be built in. Uh, so Veronica said, you know, code it in. But so I think this kind of like inclusion. Uh, and I go back to my my point earlier about uh, you know keeping human and societies in the loop. 
uh, that needs to be very, very intentional. Uh, and at times, it is at the expense of uh, of speed. Uh, it, it it is more. Um, um, it's um, yeah. It, it's uh, it takes longer. It, it's more. Um, it's more costly. Um, but but that's that's how. Uh, for example, you may have some some groups that would actually say, you know, this result doesn't seem right. You know, there's something there's something off here, and you need to have that kind of feedback um, to to actually yeah sometimes actually see this uh, this um, this bias, and it's of, of course also a way of. Uh, of minimizing the risk of digital divide, uh, because you need you need this like intentional investment in in building those kind of of, of, of systems, um, and that brings me to the to the a second point, and then I will you know stop there for now, um, which you know goes back to what you said uh, about the the role of experimentation, uh, and so yeah, I I really want to stress the the fact that it's um, at the end of the day it's it's very cultural. So what I mean by that is that, you know, one cultural change or what I what I would call a cultural change in the space of evaluation, uh, which is you know very well known to evaluators, is the, the move from from proving to improving. Um, and it's a bit of a you know, common phrase and you know, we've heard it a lot. But still, um, really, the goal is not to um, know for sure forever you know, what works and what you know, what doesn't work. And I often say, you know, what works is, you know, democracy. You know, democracy works. Education works. Um, and then there are things that work that work for, you know, certain goals and and and, and not for for others. But so here, the culture is one um, where you're, as Estelle mentioned, for instance, where you're, you know, willing to test out. You're, you know, willing to to try and uh, and and fail. And in organizations, uh, that should be fostered. Uh, as as much as possible, so people should be allowed uh, to fail. They shouldn't be worried about um, yeah about actually being you know being just you know monitored. Uh, in in which case they're not going to take any risks. Um, it's also the the the, the culture of uh, of um, as I said at the beginning of, of of learning, and so really we have to become better at 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 being being you know learning. Uh, groups and beings um, based on, on on multiple data sources, and that brings me to the last uh, point, which wasn't raised, but just to, which is about how and where we can get the data that are needed. Uh, once we've you know talked about the political elements, the cultural elements, there is actually a very mundane, very practical, concrete challenge, which is access. To data and interoperability uh, and the risk of privacy, questions of business model, um, and so I will, you know, leave it for maybe another uh, question. But um, it's been ten years, or fifteen years of data revolution in which I've been, you know, pretty much involved from the beginning, uh, and and that hasn't been cracked yet. So the, the this this question of access, easy access to, for instance, sensitive data that are very rich but very risky. Um, that hasn't been um, fully cracked, and so I think it's definitely one of the next frontiers that has to be worked on. Thanks, thanks, Emmanuel. Um, yeah, this issue of data privacy actually is another one that came that has come up a lot in the chats, and 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 I probably should have put it on the list of buckets. Um, if Estelle and, and and Harsh want to come in on that, maybe that would be helpful. Uh, just one thing. I mean, two of you have apologized for being simple or simplistic. I uh, please don't apologize. I think actually there was a comment in the chat complaining about complexity and how all these uh, these technologies were adding complexity. So I think the more we can simplify and keep it straightforward, I think I think the better. Um, anyway, over to Estelle. Um, thank you. Yeah, let let me be brief. I, I think. Um, you know, I, I put it as the single loop learning, the efficiency part, which seems like, okay, it's, it's the low hanging fruit. But for me, it's very important because in the end, what I, my, my own agenda is that humans, evaluators can spend more time doing the things that they are better at and which is, you know, like actually 
analyzing, thinking, collecting, going, going and having long interviews and and long focus groups and 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 really get to the the, the crux of what what we should be spending more time on rather than manually coding uh, text where where AIs can 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 really be a, a capability enhancer. And so what what I want to say here is that um, you know we're not forgetting about our own trade and some of our own comparative advantages, we really want to embed this in a fit for purpose way in a larger tool um, and, and, and really experiment with other paradigms as well. Um, so I, I don't want to give, give the impression that, you know, um, AI, data scientists, et cetera, are going to be really only at the forefront of the evaluation field. It, it remains a very mixed methods team and field, and, and I, I think that's where you know, AI and data science can play, can play a role. Um, and that means uh, just, I mean, that means really continuing to experiment on fitting all of this together. That's why this knowledge brokering theme was was very um, is very important uh, for me. Um, on the last point on 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 counterfactual. Um, um, I just want to signal that tomorrow, for instance, we have a, an IEG-led symposium on using geospatial analysis for evaluation. The afternoon is dedicated to impact evaluation, but the morning is dedicated to uh, with large, which means also like, uh, you know, embedding other types of thinking, uh, counterfactual, generative, uh, uh, and others about what works under what circumstances, what keeps changing, how do we really embrace the dynamic of change in evaluation? And I think that's that's what also Emmanuel uh, highlighted. Um, and, and, and we are better equipped to do that now um, with, with this kind of fit for purpose approach. But it's going to take perhaps another 10 years to really get to a, to a fit per, for, for purpose use of all of these tool, tools. So we have to be patient with ourselves too, even if everything moves fast. Thank you. Thanks, Estelle. Um, uh, Harsh, back to you. Yeah, no, I think uh, great uh, questions. And uh, uh, just to do a deep dive maybe on the digital divide aspects. So I'll uh, give you a quick story from uh, when I used to lead a project in Malawi on natural resources and water resources, where um, uh, we had uh, we were trying to see if we can uh, modernize their monitoring system because they had no real-time monitors for water at that time. So we said, uh, look, there are these old ways of doing things where there's basically a stick in the mud and uh, people read the levels. Uh, so he's saying, uh, look, can we make some of these real-time monitors? And they said, yeah, but we have uh, you know these gauge readers. So they had 400 of them who were being paid $1 a month uh, and we were working with them for many years. And they said, they lose their employment. We don't want that to happen. Said, okay, then plan B, at least let's give them smartphones as well. So in addition to them writing it in a book which nobody reads, they can also text it in or uh, feed it in so that it can become quasi real time. They said, fine. Then just before appraisal, they came back and they said, okay, a few of these, let's make this fully real time. So he said, what changed your mind? And they said, uh, the week before, uh, there was one of these gauge readers who had been with them for 40 years and was a week from retirement, uh, couldn't see the gauge well, went closer and got eaten by a crocodile. Right. So that kind of stuff happens uh, today. Right. Uh, so this is where the incentives uh, for people changing and modernizing are different in different places. But it's something that we all need to start exploring to try and see what living in the new world uh, may mean in terms of embracing new technologies for these kinds of uh, approaches. And also a quick uh, word on the data side as well. As Emmanuel said, one of the big challenges is access to data. When I was doing my undergrad uh, in India, all my water resources classes were done with data from the Colorado River because all the India data was secret, which is not a great way to use academia. So we all come here to work on the Colorado, but that's a different issue. Uh, so the uh, thing now is to try and see, can we help countries to put more data in the public domain? And at the bank, we are starting a livable planet open data initiative in this regard to try and see if we can help countries put more data in the public domain, which can then be used also for training a lot of the AI uh, advances that are out there for early alerts or digital MRV or, uh, you know, looking at uh, uh, smallholder farmer uh, advisory services or uh, uh, sectoral uh, data and analytics and so on. So this is, a, I think, a whole new world in which evaluation will be embedded all through uh, to try and see if we can help countries to put more data in the public domain, which will slowly also help reduce the biases that we currently have in these systems. 
Thanks, Harsh. So we have just a few minutes left. I mean, the chat is is lightening up, so I'm sure we could go on for another hour, but but we do have to bring this to a close. I'm going to suggest we close with a one rapid round, maybe one minute response from each of the presenters on where you think we'll be 10 years from now with these tools and these advances. Um, so let's just go in turn again, the same order. Uh, Veronica? Sure. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I kind of am answering it from where do I want us to be? Um, and so I'd like for us to be in a place where policymakers are actually making evidence-based decisions um, from evaluation. Um, we're not there. You heard it all week. Um, and there's many reasons why, but I do think uh, these capabilities can help us become more timely. And I think from a counterfactual perspective, um, they're already making decisions and they're not using evaluation information to do that. And so what can we do to turn it around? I think this is a great opportunity. Thanks, over to you, Emmanuel. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I very much agree with, with Veronica. I mean, uh, yeah, I think, we should discuss um, where we want to be um, in, in 10 years and, and, and how we have a higher chance of actually getting there. Um, so to, to do that, I think it's always good to look at, you know, a bit of history. I think 30 years ago when the Internet was just, you know, starting um, and, you know, we there were hopes uh, that, you know, it would lead to greater, you know, democratization and, you know, freedom of speech and so on and so forth. I, I you know, I don't want to paint, uh, you know, too, you know, too bleak a picture of today's world, but it, you know, it's certainly not as, as, uh, you know, as, as, as free, uh, as democratic, uh, as, uh, you know, rational, as evidence-based, as peaceful, and so on and so forth, as one may have expected or hoped 30 years ago. Um, and so, I hope, and and actually, technology has played a role uh, in in, um, in 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 you know yielding these you know, pretty, you know, mixed result uh, of the past 30 years. So I really think that we have to go back to, you know, simple things. Uh, so Dion, you said, you know, sometimes, you know, being simple is, so yeah, we have to be willing to learn. Uh, we have to be willing to be wrong. We have to be, uh, to be more, much more inclusive uh, in how we design, you know, all these uh, systems. Um, so it's really, um, we, yeah, it's really a, a, a mindset that I would like to see to, teach, to see change. And I will end by saying, I'm sometimes I'm a bit you know you know gloomy or pessimistic, but I think it's an amazing opportunity. Like we used to measure the world in such crude ways, uh, you know, 30, 50 years ago, with you know just you know GDP being one example of something that's a very bad indicator. Uh, and we have all this ama amazing data and all amazing technologies at our disposal to improve how we measure poverty, for instance, how, me how we measure social capital, how we measure, uh, yeah, indeed the effect or the impact of a program policy at very fine grain levels. Of, so it, it is quite exciting. Uh, there are challenges and risks, um, and it needs to be very intentional. Um, but I hope that in 10 years, um, will be much better as people and societies at actually learning and improving through learning. Thanks, Emmanuel. Uh, Estelle? As I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm really bad at foresight. I like to look look back. <laughs> but um, I would say so just on a hope, hope note. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I do hope that we use these new capabilities uh, to break past dependency, because I think that's that's really hard in organizations, in societies, um, and and try to also um, leverage these to to save our planets, basically, right? And be aware of of, of the waste that they also generate, so that we can uh, use them in a again fit for purpose. And then, yeah, that that's all I can come up with. Bye. Thanks, Estelle. Uh, Harsh? Yeah, first to uh, look back, I think uh, just to echo Emmanuel in terms of the tremendous advances that are happening uh, when I joined the bank some 28 years ago and actually helped set up our GIS thematic group at that time. There were like maybe 10 people who worked on GIS. But uh, now you have hundreds of uh, staff that are involved in some way with uh, both developing and using these kind of tools, reflecting our clients as well on the other side. So I think looking ahead, 
the two big uh, digital twin things that I think we'll see are one is open data in a big way uh, that will start revolutionizing a lot of work. And related to that is uh, uh, AI-based services, because that is going to be in everything we do, whether it be to fill in data gaps or to get insights uh, with multiple uh, kind of points of view or to uh, look at, uh, you know, trying to uh, uh, develop a lot of these services uh, for everybody uh, in different ways. But also, I think we can uh, set our sights a bit uh, bigger to say, look, why not have a digital twin for every project, right? Not just a big uh, dam or a big building and other things, so, but uh, every project really ought to have a digital twin uh, associated with it. Uh, and this should be something that the bank embraces for all of its uh, lending, I think, uh, to try and make sure that you can leverage all these different data to see a digital representation, maybe even starting even before the first brick is cast, because uh, to try and uh, do virtual versions of the project, to try and see is this what you want or something else to use as a discussion tool, and then use it all the way through evaluation to uh, try and uh, you know help uh, with monitoring, adaptive management, and trying to see if it worked or not and what else is needed and so on to look at not just individual projects, but entire portfolios in that regard. So I think an exciting future ahead. Thanks, everyone. Wow. I mean, this has been amazing. Thank you, all the Veronica, Manuel, Estelle, Harsh. This has been really fascinating. Like I said, the chat is just exploding. We could we could go on. We can't. I um, also want to thank IEG for hosting us all and bringing <clears throat> bring us together. I think this has been really fascinating, and I'm I'm glad we have we ended on a very kind of positive, forward looking note, and it it, it is, does make one hopeful. Um, speaking of IEG, I'm going to turn it over to Sabine Bernabe, who's going to close us out and and maybe point us to future exciting events. So over to you, Sabine. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dion, and thank you to all the panelists for this fascinating uh, discussion. Um, let me thank all of the speakers and panelists over the last uh, three days. This, uh, this uh, session brought this Future of Evaluation uh, event to a close. Uh, we've had some incredibly rich and substantial and uh, inspiring, lively conversations over the last three days. Um, so really sincere thanks to all the panelists and also to the moderators for excellent moderation. Um, let me just say a few words. First, I would like to uh, congratulate once again the winners of our Young and Emerging Evaluators uh, competition. So uh, big congratulations to Eni Flora Gatsi, Rumbitsa, Tizora, and Joyce Muyengwa again for their, for their uh, winning essay and the excellent presentations. Um, and I really hope that they will inspire other young and emerging evaluators to remain engaged, to continue developing their skills, and uh, to sharing their ideas. So as I was saying, uh, over the past three days, we've really had some very rich discussions, and summarizing uh, them would not do justice to some of the very insightful and important points that were made. So what I'll try to do is just briefly highlight a few takeaways um, on my side. Um, so we discussed, on the first day, we discussed how evaluation is adapting to a changing global context and how a shift in mindset is needed. The notion that evaluators are disinterested observers taking a snapshot from the back window is over. We have skin in the game and we need to address complex systems and engage local actors. We also had a very rich discussion on the future direction of evaluation, it, the profession itself, as a diverse field of practices, a transdiscipline, and a prof increasingly a profession. Our young and emerging evaluators made compelling cases for culturally responsive evaluation, and we reflected on how times are changing and the kinds of practices that are promoted by culturally responsive evaluation are likely to be more important in a context of global crises where we need to transform ourselves. So the traditional top-down model of evaluation is losing relevance. Today, we had a very rich discussion on the institutionalization of evaluation and the progress made and challenges that still remain. I think our discussion raised a number of fundamental and rather existential uh, issues. Uh, we discussed how evaluation is largely led by accountability rather than building regenerative systems. 
and there's an urgent need to focus our evaluations on the critical questions and to have more systemic approaches and to assess contribution rather than exclusively attribution to transformation. We also had a rich discussion on the need to build country evaluation capacity, to move more towards country-led evaluations, to make greater use of country systems and country commissioned evaluations. Important points were made on whether we should focus or whether evaluation should be focusing on how aid is managed or the impact aid has on people and the planet. And there was a call to integrate the human environment nexus more systematically in all our evaluations. And finally, in this session, we discussed the opportunities that are brought on by the data and technology revolution. New data and technology are enriching the evaluative toolkit, machine learning, generative AI, data science techniques, geospatial and other sources of data are expanding our ability to generate more rigorous evidence. They make our analysis more efficient, reliable and accurate. But these opportunities, of course, should be seized judiciously and data privacy should be safeguarded. So going forward, I think the challenge is going to be to turn all these great ideas into action. And we need to ensure that we're providing useful, transformative evidence, drawing on local and global knowledge, partnering effectively with countries and leveraging the data revolution. So before I sign off, uh, I would like to echo Estelle's invitation to join us tomorrow uh, for our uh, symposium on the potential of geospatial, um, of geospatial analysis in evaluation. Uh, this symposium is organized by AG and has really an impressive lineup of speakers, which um, has already now been posted up here on the, um, on the front slide. So I really look forward to continuing all these conversations. Thank you very much for very rich and enlightening uh, discussions. And um, in the meantime, I wish you all a great rest of your day. Bye. <laughs>